I uh, am going to pick up at the point where I left off, which was with this almost eight foot square uh, unfinished painting of the Adoration of the Magi that Leonardo did um, in Florence at the very beginning of the 1480s when he is working independently, but he's still quite young and is getting extremely important commissions from the beginning. Uh, <clears throat> one wonders that this never got finished and it's never, um, uh, there's no recorded um, evidence of why exactly it didn't get finished. But the great benefit we get from looking at an unfinished work that the monks who hired him did not probably enjoy sufficiently was that you can see what he's doing that is so different from uh, other artists of his era or most artists who were trained in Florence in the 15th century. And that is that he took all his incessant, insatiable interest in everything in the physical world, which he wanted to see, to record, to understand, to analyze, not just what does it look like, but how does it work? Um, all that just uh, greed for, for physical, visual knowledge. He takes all that he learns and his incredible uh, manual dexterity, and then he makes the vital leap that leads the 16th century uh, sort of founder of art history to say that Leonardo was the, um, the founder of the high Renaissance, is that Leonardo took all of that knowledge and in the end, that was just building blocks for creating an ideal world of figures who are vital, vital beyond reality, beautiful beyond reality. And in a sense, it creates a world that comes across to us as, as more real than real. So here it was, for example, in the way the figures were um, turned on their axes so they, their bodies go in multiple directions at once, or that they interlock almost like Chinese puzzle pieces as the pieces lean over one another. Uh, so that's one of the novelties which other artists will take heed of, and then this becomes part of the standard repertoire. Uh, then another is his um, reliance on shadow, that he studied light and optics throughout his career. And he was so noticing that all color is dependent upon light, how much as we know, you go into a dark room, everything's the same color, it's all, all dark. That um, it's um, shining light so on something brings it out of the darkness. So he, as if this were, as if he were the light, he, he, he makes a layer of dark and then he brings the figures out of that. And that helps to make them look more three-dimensional. Um, also here, his, his inveterate, restless, constantly improving, altering what he's doing, even once it's on the final uh, panels where he's painting, he's still changing his mind about, mm, well, I'm gonna put this here. No, I don't think I want that over there. Well, I'm gonna change this. Um, why, not, why don't I try to put this? No, well, I don't know. So as he works it over, for, actually from most minute details, even perfecting it, so just a few areas then have color on it, this um, very dilute lapis lazuli, this extraordinarily expensive pigment. And I didn't say last time the, I'm not sure it's exactly a novelty with him about that, but that he layers the color on in such thin washes. So he's again going to be able to build up and change as he goes along. It's quite novel technique. But I want to 
there are other works he did that we know in, in, in Florence in this first phase. He has a, such a, um, oh, well, I don't, wouldn't say wandering because there's a period, he spends about 20 years in Florence, 20 years in Milan, comes back to Florence for about 15 years, goes back to Milan for a while, goes to Rome, gets invited by the King of France then to finally end his days in um, France, living very near the King's summer palace. <clears throat> now his wanderings are perhaps partly his own restlessness, but it is also where there are patrons buying for his, um, his services. We do want to look at one portrait by him, probably by him. We think we have the correct identification. And it's in the, uh, I hope a lot of you have seen it, it's in the Washington DC in the National Gallery of a woman, well, the painting is now called Ginevra de Benci. Ginevra is G-I-N-E-V-R-A, then D-E and then B-E-N-C-I. Why I would bother to show you a, a slide of someone looking at art the way so many people look at art now is through is mediated through their own phone screens rather than at what's in front of them. It is because they wanted to show you this and what's hanging on the wall back here. <clears throat> because there are several curiosities just about seeing it, the painting as it is here, frame and all. It's a strange shape. It's a square, it's just about 15 inches square. And it's odd that it cuts off just essentially at her bosom. This would be a much more standard, say half length portrait. Um, I'm thinking this is probably a Flemish artist or if not, it's an Italian <clears throat> inspired by Flemish art where this first became a popular pose. Um, but so that you see more of the figure and especially it seems important to see the hands because the hands mm. can be a communicator of social status. Has this person worked? Are the hands uh, and, and their character? Is this a relaxed person? Is there tension in the body that's betrayed by the gesture? Um, sometimes you can more gets revealed through the hands than there is through the face. But this is the standard size. So at some point, this painting has been cut way down. Mm. And here it is. Now for a number of sort of Leonardo specialists find this a far more appealing painting than the Mona Lisa. Uh, so I want to talk about what's new about this because of course he's doing something already different from what everybody else is doing and show you some, some wonderful details. The identification with Ginevra de Benci was made by the former director of the national, um, <clears throat> of, of the museum because there's not an, a record where you can trace it back all the way to Leonardo's time. Although this Vestari, this great first art historian, mentioned that Leonardo had made a most beautiful painting of the young woman Ginevra. So this is perhaps it. Why you might think it's Ginevra is that what is around her almost as if it were an extremely secular halo is this bush. I'll uh, come back to the way he uses something like that for artistic reasons, but the Italian word for juniper is Ginepro. So it could be a play on her name. So perhaps this is Ginevra de Benci. If she is, we can tell you something about her as a, as a, a person. She came from an extremely affluent Florentine family, uh, was a favorite of Lorenzo de Medici. I don't know that she was a mistress. I, I think it was supposed to be a more platonic affair, <clears throat> but she was a noted beauty in her day. 
And she was a very fine scholar and poet. She wrote poetry, she corresponded with poets. Um, and there were several men who had essentially platonic devotion to her. So it seems like that, that is the kind of person that um, Leonardo might be called on to portray. Let's see what the tradition is, first of all. Oh, well, I get beyond that. Now, this is a half-length marble bust by his teacher, Verrocchio, showing a young woman holding a flower. You can see her dress style is about the same, that sort of sheer um, sort of under blouse right there. So perhaps her hands were in some gesture like that, and I'll come to explain why that, we think that might be so. <clears throat> so he could be following along in the tradition, uh, kind of an image that he, he saw in his teacher's workshop, it might be reproducing something like that. Because there is this drawing by Leonardo, it belongs to the um, British royal family and their great collection of Leonardo drawings. It's of these hands, and you can just see she's holding there the stem of some sprig of flowers. This is just a, a working sketch. Uh, you can see up through here, he's even put a, uh, he's doodling around the head of an old man. And he's just freely sketching some ideas. In fact, there's a third hand here. You see, he's starting with something different. And then he moves to this, and he's especially working just with working out the hands that articulate, articulated part of the body. And this free back and forth, oh, he loves these swirling, curving lines, and so many things will see that. So perhaps that's something like that was what was intended um, originally. Well, in what ways was this so another way is that unlike other portraits of the time, this is a portrait from just about that same period by his peer, Botticelli, of another favorite of the Medici family. And this is from about the same time. And this is a more uh, recognizable later part of the 15th century Florentine painting with that very crisp, fine, and elegant outline, contour. And then is the presentation of the woman. Um, to be seen strictly in profile. So there's a kind of a, a reserve and a modesty. Um, there's, she doesn't have to acknowledge us. She doesn't have to acknowledge that she's being looked at. And for uh, the many portraits of women that were created as um, at the behest of their fathers who wanted to marry off their daughters, they would have portraits made so that they would be circulated among eligible suitors. The man wouldn't have to see her because marriages are largely for property and dynastic reasons, but say, oh yeah, she looks good. Uh, obviously her father has a lot of money. Um, judging from the way she's dressed, you know, she's a good prospect. Now, she doesn't wear jewels, which would be in many earlier ones, the way by which a father would, through his daughter, display his wealth. But um, this was the, uh, just at the height of fashion in Florence at the time. And this was a very expensive kind of fabric with absolutely up-to-date sl sleeves like this. So she's modest, wealthy, and uh, you might maybe over interpret, but with this long swan neck, and that's so much partly Botticelli's style, but you have the idea that this is a woman, she's got good breeding in her bones. So what you do not get is anything about her character. Now I switch 
and this is not a very good um, slide, so I apologize for that. But I wanted to show you, um, this is probably a, a Florentine merchant from about the same time. But this is a painting made by a Northern European artist, Hans Memling from Flanders. And his paintings were wildly popular. The many Florentine merchants and bankers, when they, if they were stationed in Bruges or elsewhere in the North, would commission portraits from him and then send them home. They, they would pay top dollar because one of the things that uh, Memling was doing was introducing these kind of interesting little landscape backgrounds. And he did something that in, was common in the North before it was in the South. <clears throat> and that is rather than to show figures in profile or strictly frontal, to give this three quarters view, which gives a greater sense of the corporeal nature. Uh, and there's another feature which unfortunately does not come across so clearly here. It's an oil painting and oils were common in the North before they're just inter being introduced in Leonardo's day in Italy. With oils, you can get more luminous colors, greater gradations, um, just a sense of glow, of real light on something, which certainly in tempera, you can't, you know, tempera is, is like working with poster paints. You can't really put one color on top of another without getting mud. <clears throat> well, let's go back. Uh, I'll flip through this all again so we can look at our hole first. So this is oil. And not only is that three quarters view, but she is looking directly at you, isn't she? With those slightly hooded eyes, it would be very difficult to know what's going through her mind to sort of fantasize about that. But I, at least I have the sense that she's really appraising me. And she looks out that she is completely self-possessed. Uh, of course, with this flawless pale skin. And then look what Leonardo does with light. And for that, I will again go back to the details. But among other things, the contrast with little bits of light shining through in the spikes here, just a little bit of light here, enough so that the back of her shoulder gets some light to set it off from the darkness there. And even a little light right along there, a light bouncing off her neck and chest and hitting the underside of her chin. Now, do you find lines, say, around her mouth? Mm, no. A line with light, maybe here. And then, of course, light over here for this side of the cheek. The slight shadow on her flesh of the edge of that sheer garment or that heavier black ribbon casting a shadow. This is the most minute realities of objects seen in light. And then uh, a landscape as in the Northern ones and as he will generally do. As opposed to that fawn soft skin, then you have these tendrils. And I can take you one closer yet. This is where a reproduction is going to be so much better than seeing the original because you could never, ever get this close. You can't really, except maybe this dark line here and slightly thicker line there. Talk about line. Oh, maybe 
individual hairs in their brow, except light hitting each of these, I already said how he loves doing curves of these tendrils and then against her skin. And that eye, aren't you looking deep into it through the pools? Um, just a little bit of light there. So this is, this is something that you can only do in oil. If this were in tempera, to get the gradations from here to here to here, you'd have to have strokes of one dark color separated from strokes of another color and then another with very little overlapping, with maybe just a few hairs on your brush. Here, the paint can be mixed so that you have an intermediary right in here or to shape around the base of her nostril. It's just a gradual change in the color. Astonishing. Well, there's one thing that's strange though. Um, sort of strange. This is the back of the painting. The front is an oil and this is in tempera. It's like, what? And it consists of a motto, um, virtue, um, let's see. Well, let me, uh, it's essentially virtue decorates um, beauty or beauty is a decoration of virtue which was um, Ginevra de Benci's motto. But the symbol here of a palm and a laurel with just the juniper in here was of a man named um, Bernardo Bembo, who was one of those platonic lovers she had, who was a diplomat from Venice and stationed in Florence. And um, now they've done um, some cleaning and you know examining it. And originally written under here was Bembo's uh, motto, just virtue and honor. So there's some story of what happens between the front and the back, which is a still unknown. This is not by Leonardo. This is a illustration in a manuscript of Leonardo's great patron after his first period in Florence, which he left in the 1480s. Um, he, was, he was invited by Ludovico uh, Sforza, S-F-O-R-Z-A, who was the um, Duke of, of Milan, which was a, governed as, as, a, as a duchy. Ludovico did not apply to Leonardo, asking him to come up to work for his court. Although it was very clear, as I'd said last time, the, the, these rulers sort of aggrandized their power by having great artists or great intellectuals who would add luster in, to their courts. And that would be a good reason for someone to, to want to get um, Leonardo. But Leonardo applied, wrote a letter, at least, seems to be the original letter, although not in his hand, a job application to Ludovico. And in that letter, he enumerates all the things he can do. And they are largely engineering and military. He can, he can create bridges. He can create bridges that are portable. Uh, he can create this kind of weapon. He can create topographical maps so you can sort of strategize where you're going to deal with advancing troops. Um, he, can, he can create fortifications so he can do architecture. And then at the very end, uh, and I can make an equestrian portrait for you um, in, in bronze. Well, none of those things that Leonardo says he can do, is there any evidence that he did while he, up to that point in Florence? Maybe he had, but the, it doesn't survive. But he, remember, he worked in the studio of Verrocchio, who was a painter, but primarily a sculptor and had worked in bronze. And if you worked in bronze, you most 
might make works of art, but you also made utilitarian objects like cannons, like other kinds of weapons, even like cannonballs. So he's been around it. And he must have learned as, as a pupil, at least part of that. Now, why would Leonardo be wanting to flee? Seems like fleeing anyway, Florence at that time. It's probably because he'd been one of the men arraigned as being part of a coterie of homosexuals. And um, it, 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 around one young man, sort of like, like he's the ringleader of the group. And um, it isn't that homosexuality was, hmm, it was fairly well tolerated. I mean, it's just being a part of life, but, but there was something about this one young man at the center that just caught the ire of some official. So Leonardo's name is brought up on this and funny, um, he pulled strings so, and others pulled strings so that the case was um, dismissed, but he just might have wanted to leave um, Florence during that embarrassment. Why do I go on at length about this? Because to me, it's like, who cares? Well, I'll tell you who cared. Sigmund Freud wrote the very first psychoanalytical study of an artist. Um, and it's called... Um, Leonardo da Vinci, a psychosexual study of the man. Freud was fascinated by Leonardo, the fact that he left so much unfinished that he did so many women with these kind of enigmatic smiles that he keep coming back to the same kind of Madonna type. And then there is a story of the, this, and there's no evidence that he was ever interested in women. Um, late in life, Freud was, wanted to take back some of the diagnosis that he gave to uh, Leonardo because some of it turned out to be based on a mistranslation into German of a word, if one of the dreams that Leonardo had recorded in his notebook. But I just want to get this in, bring in some parts of the fame of Leonardo post Leonardo's time. Anyway, so here we have Ludovico and Ludovico invites Leonardo to come up. To, and then he will be in uh, Milan from 1982 to um, uh, 1482 to 1499. He leaves at that time because the French have come in and expelled Ludovico. No work there. So we start with a thing that was his Lure, we assume, one of them for uh, with, with Ludovico, and that is to produce an equestrian um, statue. Leonardo's teacher Verrocchio was at exactly that time producing this figure, which is in Venice. This uh, magnificent is a, a man named Colioni, who was the sort of a mercenary soldier who was hired to um, defend with um, his troops, the city of Venice and uh, to lead also Venetian men. So it's, it's very much this martial taught with energy figure here. So Leonardo, what could be better than to try to break your bonds with your teacher by outdoing him, by doing something like this. And then of course it goes back to the bronze equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius in Rome from the second century AD. But rulers on horseback, that was just a um, ne plus ultra in terms of um, prestige and power, dominance over a powerful horse, the horse itself was powerful and uh, became an image. Well, here's Donatello's of a ruler in Padua. And there were others, even the first Roman emperor in the Ninth century had a coin of himself shown riding a horse like this. So Leonardo's ambition with this was to make the largest equestrian portrait ever. And it was to be uh, a monument to Le Ludovico's father, who was the sort of the founder of the dynasty. And Leonardo worked on it on and off for at least 12 years. 
there are countless drawings related to it. And this is probably one of the very first, and this his initial idea is that he was going to, again, not do just what everybody else did. He had a horse rearing up. Um, there's a captive or a fallen soldier beneath. Now that's a, a trope, that's kind of standard. But uh, that's on coins in bronze to have what this arm hold up the weight of all the bronze of this figure up here. How, how are you going to, I mean, where's the centered balance? How are you going to do this? Later, Michelangelo will mock Leonardo for Leonardo's just not able to finish anything and doesn't know how to do this. But that was the first idea. And then he did many, he did just so many drawings of horses. He would do other battle scenes and use horses in them. But he does an ideal horse, as you see here, or um, he will show horses in motion. And then he does ideal proportions and he does some drawings in which he has exactly the measurements for the ideal horse. So you see, he has to know everything about it before he starts. So he needs to know about the animal. He needs to settle on a pose. He needs to amass the material. Well, it, he collected, imagine the cost of this, about 75 tons of bronze. Then you have to create a cast of clay and then build a mold around that. And then with the mold, you have to build a foundry where you can pour the bronze uh, and then how are you going to pour the bronze, keeping it hot enough so that it will get to all the smallest areas in the mold of something that's 26 feet high? It's, who knows if it's even possible at, then, at that point. Here's one of his drawings when he's working about now, how is it going to get the, uh, this would be the sort of the, not just the armature, but how, how are you going to get the, how is it going to distribute the bronze so that it reaches all these areas before it cools? So this is one of his ideas of how he might do it, sending it all through these a whole series of channels. So he's working on this um, while doing other things at the same time. But it comes to naught because the French forces begin to threaten Milan and that Bronze was then appropriated to be turned into cannon. Ultimately, around 1499, the French do overwhelm Milan and the large clay model, which had been actually shown at a wedding of a member of the Sforza family in the year before. I mean, there was such pride and prestige in that alone. But the French troops used that play model for um, artillery practice, so it was destroyed. Leonardo has in his notes somewhere about the Duke is gone, his property is gone, uh, and none of his works is finished. He does, Leonardo doesn't even say my work is not finished. But so it was a, a multi-year elaborate investigation it went nowhere until, this is in Milan now, uh, in the 70s, uh, um, a man in Pennsylvania named Charles Dent, he read an article in the, I think it was the National Geographic about the, un, the unrealized project for a horse and he decided to finish it. So um, he was an amateur artist himself. But he spent years getting the money for it and then he started to work on it, he died. The foundry in Beacon, New York, decided to pick up on the project. And they found a woman who was an animal sculptor who then did years of research and she produced a horse. It's about 20, uh, uh, 20 some feet high. And it was cast and this is the chief cast and it's just called Leonardo's horse. Um, who knows if this is ultimately the form that Leonardo would have chosen, but this is the horse. And, so this was uh, inaugurated in Milan in the late 90s. And there are, I think there's a copy somewhere in Minnesota. Um, there, it's on various scales in various places. 
So that's the, what happened to it in the modern age. So what else is Leonardo doing at this time? Well, you know this, if you know anything about Leonardo, and that is he was creating the Last Supper for this church, Santa Maria della Grazia, which was the church of the Sforza family um, in Milan. And for the adjacent, um, there's a monastery attached to this and for the dining hall of the monastery, Ludovico commissioned him to do a fresco of the Last Supper. He worked on it for three years, 1495, 1498. I'm sort of suspecting someone Listening might have seen this. I haven't. And I'm thinking you probably know something about its very sad history. Um, I'm gonna show you two other dining halls, the refectories that have scenes with the uh, Last Supper in it. It's the perfect scene to have on the wall for monks or nuns as they're at their meal, they have the model and the person on whom they model their lives. You have the scene up above and it's see as if on the up, upper floor as it would the last supper was. So their tables would be along here and they could spiritually more closely connect with the participants up there. Well, with Leonardo's inquisitiveness and restlessness and very slow way of working, working in conventional fresco is out of the question because in true fresco, you have to put the pigment on the wall while the plaster is still wet. And you can't go back and, and work it over very much. So it, it was just, just, just incompatible. And so, Leonardo experimented, he thought he would mix oil in with the plaster. Uh, it proved unstable and uh, within five years it was flaking off the wall. So there have been countless attempts to restore and fix this. Then in the 17th century, there was a door cut through the base here. Uh, the wall behind it, evidently, the, the plaster, there's a lot of seepage. It's just a lot of wet. And then it was covered with, with uh, smoke from centuries of candlelight in here and just filth built up. Then there was a rug hung over it, so the dirt was trapped back here. That made it even worse. Napoleon, when Napoleon's troops had, were in Milan, the troops were... Uh, uh, use this as a stable for their horses. So it suffered all kinds of indignities. The worst is what happened in World War II when there was an Allied bomb hit the refectory. Well, the wall had been sandbagged and protected, so the only wall that was left was the wall with the Last Supper on it. So this is what it looks like now. About 20 years, this woman was cleaning it. There uh, was a wonderful, huge coffee table book put out of, the, of this cleaned once it was done, because this is the same procedure that was used then, <clears throat> not by her, on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. But she removed every single flake of paint, um, cleaned it, judged whether it was original or it was uh, from one of the restorations. And only if it was a restoration was it then reattached. Uh, otherwise the areas that were, um, it, and rather than put it back, they just kind of put a kind of a beige filler color in there. So you could get the idea, I have just three slides of this to see, ah, the filth. and the progressive stages of cleaning it. And the treasures that appeared once they began to clean it. The area that was irredeemably damaged was the head of Jesus Christ. 
So that's clean, but it's not Leonardo's. All right, so let's look at some. I wonder how many people have been through this. I'm, if you've gone through this at some point in class, I, I apologize. I'm assuming there are people here who haven't or hearing it again is just fine. <clears throat> okay, first, show you two other versions. Um, this was in Florence by a mid 15th century artist named Castagno. This was in a convent. Um, and again, you see it's up on the wall. And here it is a close up. It's a marvelous study of one point perspective and a knowledge, just flaunting the knowledge of all antiquities. Um, that were the delight in, among the Florentine intelligentsia at this time. In terms of the way the story is presented, this is one option that was quite common because here's Judas in front of the table. So, of course, Jesus has already said, one of you will betray me because each of his followers here, except perhaps these two, are lost in their own private reflection on this. Just forestall talking about this in terms of Leonardo's. The, this goes back to part what there are four different versions of the story in the four places in the Bible where this is um, the Last Supper is mentioned. But in John, it says the disciple that Jesus loved lay next to him. Well, of course, in the original and in the time of the actual Last Supper, it would have been that you recline on, 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 on benches to eat. You don't sit at a table. And through a kind of a custom, then it becomes that he just, he, he leans sometime against Jesus's breast, but he, you know, he can't recline, but he's, he's, he's down. <laughs> so that, that's where the, that has the, the textual source. None of the versions in the Bible suggest that Judas gets up and goes to the other side of the table and says, it's me. So this is a theological uh, contemplative version of it. As was this by Ghirlandaio, who was Leonardo's contemporary. And this is for a convent that's not too far from Florence. You see, it's a kind of a version quite similar to what Leonardo will do in the very elaborate tablecloths and the goods on the table. But again, it's just the imagery, the theology is just as there was in Castaños. It's not certain exactly what Leonardo is up to here. And there's a great deal written about this and it's wonderful to work at. And I do wish I had you all in front of me now so we could have a back and forth um, you know, why don't you unmute for this part? If you would, that would be just wonderful. Okay. <laughs> what I would like to ask you is, you know, Leonardo, being Leonardo, will have done incredible intensive study beforehand, not only reading all the versions in the Bible, but I will tell you, he walked, and I'll show you one drawing later on, that he walked around Milan with a little notebook over his belt, uh, looking for faces on people that matched his conception of what each of the um, disciples was like. So he was drawing from life and he was looking at physical um, types and physical expressions. So he's accumulating all of this um, 
all the kind of real world knowledge. But in the end, he creates something that utterly transcends any possible physical reality. And uh, so this is my question for you. This, this, I, I apologize if this is like, I'll just say, what's unreal about this? Think about where it is. Think about already what you know about Leonardo and with the adoration, what he did with the people in the crowd. I have you look at the setting. Think of this as setting up for dinner. And I'd also ask you to have everybody sit down. You so you see what's happening. Well, this is again, where it's not exactly clear. Jesus with his hands outstretched on the table here can be doing one of two things, or maybe this is meant to be uh, um, coalescing. He's either pointing at the bread and then there's the glass right here. This is the institution of the Eucharist. You know, this is my, my body is, is the bread. My blood is the wine. So that would be like the institution of the mass. Or this could be the moment in which he says, one of you will betray me, because oh, you can see they're reacting to that. This is fresh news. And one of them says that it's the person who's dipping his hand into the dish with me. So it might be that. Does anybody want to take a chance on this? How about doing this, set this up, in a room. What's wrong here? It's a long table, right? I mean, and not on both sides. Right. This is like, they're not on both sides. There's and not there's, enough room for enough chairs on that one side of the table. No, there oh. certainly are not. And then that table seems to go almost across the full width of the room, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, it should have well, been turned around. Behind there. Why wouldn't you make the table go lengthwise? Fit, you know. Exactly, that's what I thought. It should go lengthwise instead of across like that. Yeah. Okay, now have everybody sit down on these. Let's say it's a bench, so there's room on a bench. Is there room for them to sit? No. Oh. No, it's two people in the back, on the right hand side. These guys? Yes. Where? He'd have to be sitting in his lap. Yep. Yep. Well, Did were they called upon? Him? What? Were they were they called upon to simply get on the one side of the table for this uh, portrait? Maybe. Oh no, he didn't. He didn't have anybody pose for him. This, ultimately, all those drawings then produced something that he created in his mind. This is his vision. Okay, and then where's Judas? Judas. Huh. Third from the left from Jesus, I think. And why, Jeff, did you know that? Because I've seen several Zoom classes about <laughs> <laughs> Yes, this is Judas. Now, how does the, I, I, I will take you through and we'll look at all these various details because there's so much on this. It's just, it's such a model of concision and elegant simplicity that the deep levels of complexity, you really have to pick at it to get them. But here's Judas. He's the only person who pulls back into complete solitude. And the only one whose face is absolutely in darkness. Mm. Yeah. So he knows within himself, and that's a kind of like a outward sign, like a dark character. Yeah. Okay, then let's, so now I'll, I'll, I'll start parts and we'll go through it all. Looking at, the, oh, I have one funny one and then we'll come back. 
Well, that, that's, this is what you're going to see. Like, why you have that long room this way? Uh, well, this is with the perspective scheme. It is then so you have so many lines taking you to all the way, all the coffers on the ceiling. These are flower sprigged tapestries along here. They all take you right to the head of Jesus. Right. So, you know, right way to look. And then look at this. this. I love this next one. This is a reenactment of it. I had students do this. They had a terrible time. Because you can't, you know, these figures, they, they need more space. What, as here, they show them as opposed to the way they're shown here. So he packs them in. Now, I'll, we'll start with the figure of Jesus. First of all, you look at his pose. There's that Renaissance triangle, an equilateral triangle, which is the calmest, most stable, ideal geometric shape. And who is the calm, stable, ideal figure in the center of this? In some senses, Leonardo is making this into as if it were real in that he does not take the a halo. Although this is a doorway back here and it has an arched frame up here. Uh, yeah. But you know you're going to see him most because he's, that's the only head that's it's a self only isolated against the blue sky. <laughs> you, you, you go right there. And you got what? A door and two windows. You have another three. You have the three, that's a suggestion of the Trinity. And you have that three. And then look at the way these people are arranged. There are four groups of three. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm. There are musicians who say that there are, you can actually measure out intervals in here that match something in music. Now, I, I can't go there I, with anybody, but they say, and you know, uh, he was a musician. There, there is a kind of like a, a basic musical mathematical harmony under this as well. All right, and then what else does he do with these figures? Um, we don't instant, nobody immediately says, oh, 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 look at this, those figures, oh, they're way too big. Uh, they couldn't sit down because we are so human centered, you know, oh. People are bigger than the world around them. Well, yeah, that, that's what we think of them. And then to make them look even larger, they wear these sort of generic biblical robes with these great swirling sleeves and long cloaks. So every large form becomes even larger. Look at those sleeves there. Then I'll take you through some. Now, this is his drawing, one of his drawings. Now, you see, he started out thinking of doing it the conventional way. And when he did this, maybe drawing on the people he saw, these are real figures, aren't they? Those are faces that you could find. as opposed to the grandeur of these. Oh, oh, well, let me go back to one more thing with the composition. It could be a little bit like birds on the wire if you didn't do some sort of clustering. And then what does he do to bring you back to the center? Bartholomew bolting out of his chair, leaning over aghast at what he's hearing. So it's like a parenthesis taking you back here. And this is Peter. He's maybe like questioning about it. So his hands are out and, and this one's gesticulating. So that's leading you back to the center. Just like the room takes it back and back and back. And you see how precious little of the original color is still there. But for centuries, and people didn't even know that some of the details on the table existed. There's one thing that I think when you look at this, is like, what is this about? This knife, 
let me show you where that is. This is um, this figure. He has his arm akimbo, and that's the back of his hand against his thigh. And that's, that's the knife reaching that way. See, so the knife goes over here. So, so much for Dan Brown saying that this is a woman. Uh, it is true, evidently, that Leonardo used a young, an adolescent girl, because he, as I said, he, he loves that adolescent, sort of not fully deformed, defined sexuality and, and, and appearance in, in faces. Um, but it is St. John right here. Hmm. So you see, that's his model for Judas. Hmm. Everything on the table. This is Thomas, who's also known as Doubting Thomas. So he, he's the one who happens to be pointing up. But there's this, these wonderfully expressive hands. Isn't that awful? So this is just a little bit cleaned. the transparency in this glass, the gleam in the silver, the shadows of the plates on the tablecloth, even the seams from where the tablecloth has been folded. I'm gonna show you this face and this face. Down here in this sketch he did, oh, this is probably a part of uh, uh, some remodeling he had in mind for the castle that belonged to Ludovico. This looks like um, an idealized head. He might have had someone pose for that, though. Mm. This. Tiny scraps of the original color. Doesn't this just have such luster as if that's satin? All right. Well, there's that. Oh, my goodness. We certainly, you know, I, I do. I didn't intend to be so untruthful in the advertising of this class. Uh, we are going to spend more time on Leonardo next time because I don't know how it happened that, that the hour went by and we still, ha we haven't even gotten to the Mona Lisa and we didn't get to Andy Warhol, but we will next time. And if you have any questions, comments, please, we'll take this next time. I'll stay. Andy, when we were there, yeah, it was in a climate controlled space and we had to go through a virtual airlock to prevent any of the outside humidity from entering the space where the last supper was was uh, were you limited in how long you could sit be in there yeah. uh, yes they they yeah. um, they only let a certain number of people in at a time and if enough people left uh, they would they would let other people in. Yeah. Also, I, I think it's like the prehistoric caves at Lascaux that they, they have to do something like that. Yeah. Also, the also the room was very dark because they wanted to preserve it. So we couldn't see it the way you're showing it to us. Yeah. 
I did just send you a photo that I took of it. So all but right, thank you. Well, um, I know the time's over, so but look, look, I, you know, I want I, I like to just uh, if I can't rattle you, I ought to try. <laughs> We're gonna look at this Mona Lisa by Marcel Duchamp. And this, um, later in life he said, well, what this means is that she's hot down below. I'm thinking maybe some of you saw it when it came to New York. And we are going to be looking at, especially this one. Andy Warhol's Last Supper. So we have a way to go. And I hope to see you next week. The hour goes too fast. Oh, that was I beautiful. Think so too. You know, I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm just in the groove. I always liked Leonardo. But... I'm in such awe. <laughs> it's such a, it was like, <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Any more? Otherwise, I say farewell. Oh, thank farewell. You. Thank you. Thank you.